This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Hello everybody. The next talk in this session is by Stefan Wenz and it is about summarizing hotel reviews. Please give this man a warm welcome. Hi everyone. My name is Stefan. Thanks a lot for coming to my talk. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay, ish? Okay. Well, um, I'll try to speak up a bit. So, I, my name is Stefan. I work for Trust You, a company right here in Munich um, that has existed almost 10 years now. We have over 100 people working for us. We do many different things, but the one thing that we really do well at our core is analyzing hotel reviews and then summarizing them in a way that is useful for hotels and for hotel guests looking for their next hotel to book. And we've done all this um, based on various technologies in Python. And what I'm going to do today is show you how we do it, highlight specific technologies, and um, hopefully you learn something along the way. But first off, about those numbers I put in the title, those Beatty numbers I used to, to get you here. Um, what I mean by that? So our main product is actually called Trust You Analytics. That's a reputation management tool for hotels. 10,000 hotels, actually more than 10,000 hotels, use it to analyze the reviews that they get. If you've ever stayed in a Motel One, in an Ibis hotel, in a, um, then they were using our software to analyze your feedback. For example, for this hotel right here, we're telling them um, your overall score is pretty good, but people complain about your reception. They say, you can't see all this on the screen, you would have to click through, but uh, they say that your check-in process is slow and they give you lower grades due to that, so you should fix it. So that's what we make most of our money with, but we have a second pillar in our product offering. We make summaries of those hotel reviews that are useful for hotel guests to pick their next hotel. And chances are, if you book a lot of hotels online, you may have seen our data somewhere already because it's integrated on Google, Hotels.com, Kayak, um, so that screenshot here is actually from Kayak. As you're booking a hotel, it tells you, service is awesome, cleanliness is great here, the breakfast doesn't get such good grades in the reviews, so if, you're really, uh, if breakfast is really important to you, maybe this isn't your hotel. So 100 million travelers and... Oh, I thought there was a slide right after that. Never mind. Well, actually, what I wanted to tell you what I wanted to show you is our data is integrated on Google. I'll look for the slide afterwards. You'll just have to believe me, right? So how do we do all that? Here's a simple architecture diagram, and I've kept it in simple terms so that people can keep up. Um, we do a lot of scraping. We pick up reviews from Booking.com, TripAdvisor. We collect our own reviews for the hotels. We pull in lots of content. Um, we have a database of about 500 million hotel reviews. So. That's a lot of reviews, it's not huge data, but it's big data. So all the analysis that I'm going to talk about today happens on a Hadoop cluster. We use the Hortonworks distribution, in case you care about that. So we need to have big data tools to analyze this amount of data. And then any, any data points contained in our summaries, I actually extracted from the hotel, sorry, from the review text itself. So we don't just average scores or something boring, no, we actually analyze the text and when we say, breakfast isn't great, it's because people in their text said breakfast isn't so great. So we're going to talk about NLP later and there's a certain dose of love that needs to go into the NLP component. That goes right into the machine learning. You'll see that machine learning at Trusty is most, mostly used uh, as an after step to the NLP, that it's more linguistic approach. Um, it's a post-processing step with a good dose of magic and all of that is done in Python. We have an API that is used by Google, Hotels.com, Kayak, and all these other guys to show our data. So a word about Hadoop. Um, I've chosen this picture of a herd of elephants to symbolize Hadoop. Obviously Hadoop has the elephant as, as its ma mascot animal, and this is quite fitting because um, it's slow and massive. What I mean by that is, you know, once it gets in motion, it can really move a lot of data, let's say, but it takes a while to get started. But still, it's a f it was the first famous big data tool, and um, we were adopting this technology and we're wondering, can you run Python on Hadoop? And the answer is yes, you can. 
it's possible, but it doesn't quite look right. So what do I mean by that? Um, Hadoop has, an, uh, has a, let's say, has a feature that's called Hadoop Streaming, which allows you to plug in any kind of executable code um, into the framework. That's very flexible, but it offers you only a very simplistic interface um, to the Hadoop framework. Much of the more advanced features are uh, not available through its Python interface, and in a more complex project, you end up writing Python with lots of boilerplate code and then Java code to fill in some of the gaps. Not nice. So we were happy we could use Python for big data, but this certainly didn't seem like a good solution. This node here in the middle is a JVM with too little memory configured. You'll find out soon enough when it runs out of memory. But there's hope. Spark is much nicer than Hadoop. <coughs> Spark is what we use now for new projects. Don't learn Hadoop unless you apply a trust you because we still have lots of legacy code in Hadoop, then you're going to have to learn Hadoop. Otherwise, just learn Spark. It's faster, mostly because um, much of the computation it does, it tries to do in memory, whereas Hadoop forced you to break down your computations into small chunks and write to disk every time. Spark doesn't do that, and Spark is much more uh, concise, much more powerful, because besides map and reduce, which are the fund fundamental operations that Hadoop supports, it has many more. But let's, let's look at an example to show you what, uh, what working with Spark actually looks like. Let's try to find out from the source code of CPython how old is all the C code in there. I bet some of it is pretty dusty, right? So what I mean by that is let's look at all the lines of code in .c files in the CPython repository and see when it was last changed. So this here isn't Spark yet, it's just uh, me on my bash, git cloning the CPython, running git blame on every .c file and then checking out if the output is, is, is as expected. It looks okay, what I see here is a commit ID, some random Python developer and um, the code changes that he did back in 1990. So let's go through all these lines. There's almost 400,000 C lines in that file, by the way. Uh, let's go through all these lines and see in which year uh, each line was modified and then plot a histogram of that to see how old this code really is. That's all you need to do in Spark to achieve that. Um, so how are we going to do this? We're just going to define a regular expression to get the dates and then we're going to put parentheses around the year because we just want the year for now. And I'm running this in the let's say the interactive Spark shell, pipe Spark shell that exists, and it gives you a variable called the Spark context um, SC, which for all intents and purposes is your connection to the Spark cluster. So Spark runs in a cluster of machines. Um, it's much like a MySQL connection if you're running queries against a database. And this is how easy it is to do what I just said in Spark. You load up the text file that I've called blame, you run this uh, regular expression that I've defined on all the lines uh, in a so-called map operation. And technical detail here, because the find all returns a list or an iterable, you have to do flat map to get it into a flat list of years again. So now you have, for the 400,000 lines of input, you have 400,000 years. There's a bug in this line, if you can spot it, uh, you get bonus points. And then we want to count those lines, uh, we want to count the years. How do you do that in Spark? in Spark? You do another map on the output, you transform every year into a tuple of year and one, and then you reduce by key, whereby you're adding up all the ones, and then you get a histogram of all the years. How many of you are familiar with PySpark and knew this before? A oh, couple hands. So I would argue that that's pretty, that's pretty Pythonic code, uh, except for the, the camel case, of course. There's a reason for that. That's pretty Pythonic code. Even if you've never read of, heard of Spark, you can read this and understand what it does. But there's actually, actually so much more to this because the operations that you're typing out here, the flat map, the map, the reduced by key, they're not running on your machine, they're being run in the cluster. So depending on how you configure it, depending on how many machines you have, you may be running this on 20 machines or 100 machines or thousands of machines. And in fact, as you're typing out these instructions dot flat map, Nothing happens. It's not running these. It's just recording um, a set of instructions it will need to do to get to the desired result. So really, everything you're doing, dot flat map, dot map, dot reduce by key, is kind of defining a graph of operations 
that are run on your data. Then only when you do dot collect in the end, it starts running your stuff. It does a lot behind the scenes. If you think about it, there's a lambda functions that I'm doing here. It pickles those and sends them to 20 different machines or 100 different machines, does all that for you. And um, I think it's right now the sanest way to, to do big data, to do uh, cluster computing. Any questions on this? Nice, right? And map and reduce are, of course, operations, the only operations that are available in the famous MapReduce framework. Um, Spark has much more. It's got filter, it's got join, it's got union, uh, so you can just write much more concise code. So let's look at the data. The development of Python was actually started on January the 1st, 1970, as it turns out. Many software projects were started on that date. It's weird. Um, but then there was a long period, two decades of inactivity, until a guy called Guido in 1990 picked up the project and revived it. <laughs> what this thing actually tells you is that most of the code is relatively fresh, like written in the last 10 years, with a giant peak around 2010. What, what happened there? Was it the, the release of Python 2.7 that actually came out that year? Was it some other big refactoring? I looked into it and no, it was just a guy who uh, changed the indentation on all the C files. So that obviously messes up your Git history. It was funny to me while I was running this that the Python repository is plagued by the same kind of problems that your repositories probably are. The, there's always the one 1970 commit and then changing tabs messes up everything. Anyways, let's spend the last 10 minutes talking a bit about the fundamental approaches we use to NLP. So Trusty employs both linguists and machine learning guys in their team. And in some ways those are competing, you know, competing perspectives on how to do NLP. But we try to do both and marry them. Well, you know what I mean. So how I thought about how would I explain grammars and parsing to a crowd such like you. I think the best way is that linguists actually try to analyze language much in the same way that the Python interpreter analyzes Python. So let's have a brief peek at how that looks. When you're in the repository, the CPython repository that I just explored, there's a famous file in there that is called grammar. And that's what it actually is. It's the complete grammar of the Python language just written in this um, EBNF form is what it's called. And it's actually a sign of good language design that in a couple of dozens of lines you can write down the complete grammar of the Python language. It's actually very hard or impossible to do that for a language such as, uh, such as C++, which is much more difficult to parse. But for Python, it's this easy. And it, it's written in the form of production rules. I'm not sure if you've ever um, been confronted with such a way to write production, well, language grammars. But it's very easy to read. It just reads, to make an if statement, you start with the token if. Then comes a test, which is defined somewhere else but it's probably something that evaluates to, to true or false. Then comes a colon, then comes a suite, which is an indented block. Then comes between zero and n else if blocks, and then an, a one or zero else at the very end. That's really easy to eat. And there's, by the way, the new async, which you can write in front of a function definition, but also with statement and a for statement. I need to read up on that again. Um, but given this grammar, the process of parsing then becomes given an input string, for example, your program code or a hotel review, you either determine or you guess. Sometimes you can determine, sometimes you need to guess. The grammar production rules that were used to generate it or that can be used to generate it. And in the case, in the case of Python parsing, that gives you an abstract, abstract syntax tree. And you can do something very similar with natural language. So here's a very gross oversimplification of how you can extract a fair amount of uh, opinions in hotel reviews. This is using a library called the Python Natural Language Toolkit, very good instructional library. And I've written a similar grammar to the Python grammar before, where I say, an opinion from a hotel review is either a noun followed by a copula verb, followed by an adjective, this is for English, by the way, or it's an adjective and then a noun. These are called non-terminals, so at some point I need to resolve them to terminals, like actual words that appear in the text. This is just one way to do that. But here, let's say, all the nouns we care about are either hotel and rooms. The copular verbs are is and are, and there's two adjectives. 
And if you use the NLTK with that little bit of code, you can parse the phrase great rooms, and that parse tree down there comes out. So this one is opinion is adjective and noun, and then adjective are resolved to these non-terminals. Terminals, sorry. It's pretty simple, but you can get very far um, doing this kind of stuff, and that's a similar system to this is really at the core of TrustU, working in 20 different languages, um, and it's complemented by machine learning, of course. So in the last couple of slides, I wanted to, to highlight some technologies that are used in the TrustU stack and that you might, you might find useful if you ever have an NLP problem to solve yourself. Have you guys heard of word to vec A few hands. word to vec essentially is, is a class of algorithms that map words to vectors. So here you can see a word and a vector that comes out. What's the point of all this? You try to make this mapping in a way that uh, words that are semantically similar are close to each other in the vector space. So that cat and do or cats and dogs are much closer to each other than, let's say, chair or something. And there's a simple trick that word to vec exploits to, to make this happen, which is similar words tend to occur in similar contexts. Like, um, the kind of phrases that cat and dog appear in have more words in common than the ones with chair. And that works surprisingly well. And uh, it's a great way to uh, train your machine learning algorithms based on textual data, because you always you always have problems with sparse date data when you're uh, training machine learning on, on text. This one helps you overcome that. I did have some fun with word to vec I downloaded the descriptions of all the meetups from meetup.com in the world, trained uh, it was a couple of 10,000, a couple of 100,000. I trained a word to vec model on it. When you say train a model, this is an unsupervised model, meaning you don't need to go in and annotate anything. You just put in lots of data. It cranks for a couple of seconds, and then done is your word to vec model. And then you can ask it questions like, um, based on the meetup descriptions in the world, what are the three most similar topics or terms to Python? And it says JavaScript, PHP, I'm sorry about that one, and then Django. So that's pretty good. Then you ask it, Python, C++, JavaScript, which one is the odd one out? C++. And then just to prove to you that uh, meetup.com is not all about programming and uh, programming languages, you look for ladies, and you get girls and mamas and gals, which is um, there's lots of women-oriented meetups at meetup.com, and they use this funky language. Um, so that kind of technology is actually used quite a lot at TrustU, but we use something called Doctovec, which does the same thing, but it actually transforms an entire document, not just one word, into a vector. In our case, what's a document? Well, let's say a hotel is a document, a hotel with all the results of the semantic analysis, this grammar thing that I showed you before, makes one big document, and you transform that into a vector space, and this time um, it's not words with similar meaning that are close to each other, it's hotels with similar language in the reviews that are close to each other. So that means luxury hotels are close to each other because there's certain kinds of words people use when they talk about it. Or, I don't know, casino hotels will have a very distinctive cluster in the vector space. And that's, um, well, we have many, many signals that go into our machine learning, into our classifiers, but this one is the basis for everything because it just captures so much information from the text and uh, encodes it so intuitively. Dr. Vec, which you can uh, download the Gensim library, that's the one I've been showing on the previous slide. Um, Dr. Vec is in there, it's actually been committed to Gensim by an engineer of ours, Miguel, who's giving a talk at the same time uh, in another room. And I think I still have a couple of minutes? Yeah, you have three and a half minutes. Awesome. Oh, here's the, here's the Google slide. I put it at the end. So I wasn't lying when I was saying uh, our data is on Google. Should have shown that in the beginning, then you would pay more attention probably. So when you go and look for a hotel on Google, they even admit to it by showing this little bubble there. I'll mention one more technology at the very end. Trust You, in some ways, runs on Spotify software. A, because we listen to music while we code. And B, because we use uh, a framework that is created by Spotify called Luigi. 
Now, as you can imagine, to get from you know, a hotel review on TripAdvisor and on Booking.com to a finished summary that is on Google, you need to do many different steps that depend on each other. And in the beginning, Trusty was writing like bash scripts that said, do this, then do that, and do that. Dump this from the database, run this in the Hadoop cluster. We basically had lots of different tasks to do, very heterogeneous tasks, and if something failed in the middle of it, it was a pain in the ass to debug. So whenever you have a complex series of tasks to run with dependencies between them, you should remember that libraries such as Luigi or Airflow, or uh, there's a couple more now, exist. Luigi particularly, um, also quite Pythonic, I think. In Luigi, you define units of work as tasks that look like this. Um, and this one reads basically like so. To make this file on your local file system, you need these other two tasks to be done. And then once they're done, you can run that down there below, and that's supposed to create the output file. It's basically like a Pythonic make file, if you look at it. Make files have exactly these three components to it. And then Luigi has lots of uh, convenience code to run Hadoop jobs for you, run Spark jobs for you, dump data from the database for you. So all these heterogeneous kind of execution contexts and data sources uh, all come together as a Luigi flow. And Trusty uses it like crazy. And um, I'm not going to explain to you what all these things mean, but just supposed to prove that um, lots of crazy tasks run at Trusty every time. So I hope you've enjoyed the talk. This is, uh, this is Trust You all in one picture. We gave the girls white shirts so you can more easily spot them. <laughs> it's funny how they cluster together there in the front, almost as if they're afraid of all the men. Um, Maybe the men are afraid. I think that's more likely, actually, yeah. So we're hiring data engineers. Um, if you liked everything you saw now, want to learn more about that. Um, but we're also hiring web developers. Um, I didn't focus on that a whole lot today, but uh, this product that we make for hotels, we have a pretty big team, about 10 people, full stack web developers. If uh, you have web development experience and you want to get into the data science, then trust you, it's your company. Thanks a lot for your attention. Any questions? <laughs> Steffen, thank you very much for your interesting talk. And you were finished 10 seconds ahead of time, so we have plenty time for questions now. There's one. Uh, thanks for your interesting talk. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more about your uh, set of technologies? So as far as I heard, you use Spark, uh, then you use NLTK. That means that NLTK is run in Spark. And uh, about your machine learning, do you use Spark to embed it to machine learning? Sure. So the question was um, to elaborate a bit more on our technology choices. Um, I was actually painting a slightly wrong picture of Trusty today. Much of our code, nothing is true. Everything was a lie. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Much of our code still runs in, in Hadoop. Um, we have a cluster running the Hortonworks distribution, which actually allows you to run Hadoop and Spark on the same cluster. Um, we don't really use the NLTK. I would say we use one or two classes out of the NLTK, but um, then wrote custom code ourselves in a, in a closed source Python framework. And then about the machine learning, um, we use a mix of Gensim and scikit-learn, I think, to run our classifiers. No deep learning yet, I trust you. Uh, hope that answers your question. Yeah, and uh, uh, you promoted Luigi, which is used for data file one thing, so why don't you use Uzi? Uzi requires you to write XML files. Mm. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bad CTO, sorry. Make irrational decisions. Cool, thank you very Currently much. no more questions. I'll push one in. Uh, when you do the passing of uh, the reviews, um, I, I remember that great rooms. How do you verify that the passing is actually correct? Not say it has n doesn't have particularly great rooms or not so great rooms. Um, is that, yeah, well, how do you verify passing in general or, uh, yeah? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. Even if you go back to this thing, yeah. uh, there's actually plenty of bugs possible. This thing would allow to say, hotel are great. That's wrong. 
that's probably from a phrase where it says the rooms in the hotel are great and I would wrongly capture that, right? So errors happen if you do this. Um, we mostly counter this by using machine learning classifiers as a secondary system that evaluates what this system outputs. It says uh, the match produced by the grammar, is it likely to, uh, likely to be correct given the words inside and the words just before and just after it and um, it's smart enough to, to figure out the kinds of mismatches that I just mentioned and sometimes it even detects sarcasm. So that's nice. Yeah? Good question. So the question was, um, we have these 500 million reviews analyzed. As we make improvements to our system, do we retrain or rerun it? Um, I would say that we persist the opinions that we find in the reviews and periodically, every couple of months, we rerun the old stuff uh, and get rid of some of the old errors. Sometimes in the beginning there were really bad errors that we needed to get rid of, but we're good enough by now to do this only every couple of months. The blunt guy was first. <laughs> We support 20 or 21 different languages, and, uh, and you wrote custom NLP rules for all exactly. Yeah. Every time we start a new language, it's like, oh my god, I hope this works. But so far, we've always been able to define a couple of grammar rules that help us get at the core of the language. There's some languages where we don't do this grammar stuff, where we just go straight to machine learning. Um, some languages. Um, are so unexplored linguistically, like Thai, for example, that there's no good tokenizers, there's no good sentence tokenizers. You don't even know where to start. So we just throw machine learning at the problem and um, don't think about the grammar for now. Yeah? Are you aware that Google is a natural language understanding library of your source? Do you take it into account for your architecture? Um, we've used several open source libraries by Google and then selling basically their own analysis back to them for money, so that's working out great for us. Yes. <laughs> Word to Vec, for example, that's, uh, we use an implementation that Google open sourced. So, no more questions, good thing, because we're running out of time for questions. Thank you again, Stefan, for your talk.